All right, hello, hello, hello. Uh, my name is Ebony Bell. I am the owner and editor-in-chief of TAG Magazine, uh, and I'm really excited about the conversation that we're gonna have today um, about self-care uh, and healing, especially uh, with black queer folks uh, during this time. Um, I, I don't think I need to talk about what's going on right now. Uh, it's a lot. Um, and it's really important that we take care of ourselves um, during this time so we can continue to stay in the fight and, and stay healthy. Um, so I'm super excited because I have Dr. Linnell Plummer Mercano. Uh, I called her up immediately and I was like, I, I really um, want to do something where we can help. I want to be part of the solution. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that we provided some great resources for folks. Um, and, and I think, you know, you're just amazing uh, in the work that you do. For those that don't know, Dr. Linnell Plummer Marcano is the CEO of Onyx Therapy Group, as well as a 2019 Tag Enterprising Woman. <laughs> Linnell, thank you so much for being here. If you can, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Absolutely. Of course, I'm so excited to be here today. You know, being a part of the community, I'm always willing and ready to give back. So as soon as you called and said, hey, I have some ideas, I was like, 100 percent, I'm there, I'm ready. Um, so again, I am Dr. Linnell Plummer Marcano, and I am the CEO of Onyx Therapy Group. We are a mental health company uh, with, a he with our headquarters in Washington, D.C. We have three offices in D.C., four offices in Maryland, and an office in Pennsylvania. Hopefully, we'll be opening up another Pennsylvania office, too, because we've got a lot of folks in Philly that we want to be able to get wow. in touch with. Um, I'm also faculty at Johns Hopkins University. I'm full-time faculty there, and I get to uh, teach a lot of different courses that are fun. But the newest course that I'm going to be introducing to the university is counseling in the LGBTQ community. But yeah. because we need more counselors who know how to work with us, right? Like, and who know how to get through some of their thoughts and their questions and, you know, make sure they're doing their own education and, and research and not expecting the client um, to have to figure that out. So doing a lot of great, fun work. I, um, like I mentioned, I am part of the community too. I identify as a bisexual woman. And Ebony, we should talk about that. Bisexual, that's the whole thing, right? But I identify as a bisexual woman. I am married to my beautiful wife, Megan Marcano, um, and I'm the mother of two children, Alyssa and Bradshaw. So I'm super excited to be here today. Um, I get super passionate when it comes to mental health and these topics, and even more passionate when I'm thinking about my people, whether they're black people, whether they're women, whether they're people in the LGBTQ community. They are extensions of myself, and I am extensions of them. So. To be able to talk about it and talk and, and combine all of the intersections together is what my work lies in. Yeah, well, thank you again for being here. For those of you that are watching, I'm seeing more and more people coming in. Um, please, if you have any questions or comments, you can go ahead and do it live on our Facebook page. Or for those that are watching live on our YouTube page, you can do the same thing. Those will come right to us, and we're, we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, and of course. I will have questions as well. Um, so those of you uh, who haven't seen it yet, we did a Black Lives, uh, I'm sorry, Black Queer Lives Matter tips for self-care on our website, um, tagmagazine.com. Um, Dr. Linnell Plummer Mercano gave us a fantastic list of things that we could be doing for self-care and, and healing. So um, I'm probably gonna touch on some of those things and, and have you dive in on that. Absolutely. So, my first question is, you know, with everything going on, what are you seeing from your patients? Yeah, absolutely. So I get I get the opportunity to work with a wide range of patients, um, clients, I, whether they're my direct clients and they sit in front of me um, or whether they are clients that are coming through our practice and I get to supervise my counselors um, that are working with them. So I hear a lot of different stories, but for the clients that are sitting in front of me, I, a lot of it is pain, right? A lot of it is what is happening and why are we doing this? And the recurring st stories are, you know, our parents went through this and they're telling us that we're going through it again, right? And for some of our parents, uh, for some of my clients, it's worse because when the, when the when our parents were going through the civil rights movement, we had segregation, which 
we don't always think of as a positive thing, but it is something positive when all of your people are in one area and one community and you guys can rally up with each other. But because we're spread across the country, the power isn't necessarily the same, right? And so a lot of people are just kind of feeling lost, wondering why their parents had to fight this fight. And then here we are fighting the fight again. Was their parents' work in vain? I'm hearing a lot about um, fears, right? Fears of, for their own safety, fear for their children, fear for their unborn children, fear for nieces and nephews. Um, you know, a lot of people talking about moving out of this country, right? Which would be a powerful thing if we actually did leave because we know the black dollar is heavy in this country, right? But, if, you know, are we actually valued here? So a lot of questioning like that. There's definitely moments of hope, right? So, you know, we, we see what the impacts are. We see what's happening in Washington, D.C. Um, we see the change that mayors are trying to make and governors are trying to make in different states you know, regarding police reform and things like that. And so you see glimpses of hope. But I think right now everybody is just trying to process what they're feeling. And that's even more um, tricky, I think, for people in the LGBTQ community because we don't always have a place to kind of turn to have those conversations. Um, you know, some folks can have the conversations amongst their family, but we're not always embraced by our family. And some folks can have this with their coworkers, but our coworker situations aren't always the same, you know? And, and sometimes we can have it with our friends, but our friends are experiencing it with large depth and heaviness too. And so it's kind of like, do I want to put even more on my friends while I'm trying to process my feelings? So it's good for us as counselors to be here and hear it. We hear a similar story over and over again, and we're ready and we're prepared, right? We're ready to, to hear the story and to process and, and to help come up with solutions if that's what people want. Sometimes they don't want solutions. Sometimes they just want to talk. And, and that's good and that's okay too to just kind of get it out because once you get it out, you kind of lift that weight up even if it's temporary and you can um, start thinking about something else. So a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, a lot of confusion, a lot of what did my ancestors fight for, a lot of what's going to happen to the future, a lot of I'm, I'm going to leave this country. Yeah, I was uh, talking to a friend and I was saying that, uh, you know, we're basically having the same fight and marches our parents and grandparents had just in different yeah. clothes. <laughs> yeah, just in different clothes. That's just, yeah. It's all, it's the same. So um, that's really interesting. And I think a lot of people that are watching can probably relate to that. Uh, I know that I can. So you, you mentioned something, um, and we spoke last week about it, about having those affirming spaces. Yeah. Um, and one of the tips that you gave uh, to healing and self-care is making sure that you surround yourself, at least talking to like-minded folks, um, mm -hmm. especially with, you know, being quarantined and all the negative images we're seeing, you know, on the news and such. Um, I, I know how important those spaces are. We don't have them right now. Um, mm -hmm. Shout out to, to Wicked Bloom Mondays and, and Washington, <laughs> D.C. That would, that's a great space every Monday that we yeah. had uh, for Black queer women to, to be around each other and embrace each other and have that joy. But we don't have that now. Um, right. So so what do you suggest we do? Yeah, I think that we have to do the best we can. We have to recreate some of those environments if we can, whether it's through um, developing group chats through device, through apps like GroupMe or whether it's, you know, having scheduled um, talk nights and things like that. I, I talk with my friends. Um, by Zoom, and we, we could talk about Zoom in a second too, Ebony, but um, <laughs> once a week I try to get with some of my friends and, and still try to talk. It, it's a tricky thing because we don't necessarily get the full fulfillment in doing that, but it's important to have a place where we can release. You know, we spend so much time on social media and we're um, inundating ourselves, our brains with all of these messages. And some of us are in social media conversations where we're fighting and we're debating and and we get a joy and we get an, a, an adrenaline, adrenaline boost out of it, but it's not necessarily the healthiest thing for us consistently. And so some of that time, if we could replace some of that social media time with time with our friends, I think that would actually work better. I have so many groups going on right now, Ebony, that bring me joy. I have an accountability group with my <laughs> friends for workout. I have a sister circle. I have my leadership group for Onyx. Like, and all of those places bring me joy so that if I have to go onto social media um, and I see something disturbing or I'm paying attention to the news and I see something disturbing, I, could, I know that I have these 
small pockets of people who will bring me joy, even if we're not talking about what's happening politically, even if we're not talking about our, the deaths that are happening in our, in our communities and the intersections of our communities, it's still a place where we can talk about, hey girl, how many push-ups did you do today, right? And that in itself feels like a relief. It feels like a little escape, a little vacation, right? Um, and, and, and we need more of that. And, and although we want to always, again, talk about what's happening politically, doing it with our friends always is not always the best or safest place. Um, because they are going through their their things too. So again, I am a supporter of therapy all the time, always, and I think that's the best place. Going back to like-minded groups, the like-minded groups and like-minded people don't always have to be your friends. You can join Pain and Sips and talk to people there, right? Because we're doing those virtually. You can do a yoga set. You can do weight feeds. You can do a book club. You like. The like-minded doesn't have to be just around our identity. It can also be a place where you have hobbies and enjoyment and you get to escape for just an hour. Sometimes we need just an hour to like breathe and relax, right? And so that's what I mean by like-minded people. And we don't have to argue all the time with everybody on social media. Um, I know we have a question around that and I get really long with it, but I did <laughs> want to say that it's important for us when we're on social media to really understand what we're doing when we're on there and understanding the difference between whether we're venting while we're arguing with people um, or making posts or if we're advocating. There's two different mindsets behind it. When you're venting, you're just purging. It's just impulsive. You're just saying whatever you want to say it and then you have to deal with whatever the consequences are. But when you're advocating, there's a position of teaching that's behind it. There's the intention is that somebody is going to learn something, that there's education behind it. The feelings may very well be the same. It may be hard to, to both vent and to advocate, but it's important that when we open up those apps like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and we make these posts, we need to know what, we, what our intentions are each time we type something on there. Because again, there's a difference between venting and advocating. And everybody right now doesn't want to advocate, right? Because we've been burnt and we are hurting and we're, we've been scalded. So we don't want to touch that. And so sometimes people are venting and that's fine, but just make it clear that you're venting, right? Like just make it clear that you got to just get this out of your body. You got to get this out of your mind so that you could carry on and do the work that you need to do for yourself and for your community. Yeah, I, I love that. And, and that's a great tip. Um, before, you know, there are plenty of times I read posts or something crazy and I want to light folks up. Yeah. And then I have to take a step back. And I love that. I think that's a great tip for those that are watching right now. Are you venting or are you advocating? Are you venting or advocating? Right. And as you said, it's okay to vent. You know, we're, we're hurt. We're angry. Um, it's okay. Um, but I feel like... Um, and you can please correct me if I'm wrong, maybe we're, uh, be more um, aware where we're putting our energy. Yeah, we need to be aware of it um, in so many different ways because sometimes we put our energy out and we need reciprocity. And sometimes we're putting energy out and we need a barrier, right? But again, we have to be intentional about what, we're, what we want and need in those moments. When you're hanging out and you're having these um, these relaxing conversations are these fun and hobby conversations with your friends. You're you're looking for reciprocity in those ways. But when you're in a debate on in Instagram or social media, you're not necessarily looking for reciprocity in that same kind of way. And so we need to know what we need in those moments too. And and that need for um, interaction is higher now because we're in quarantine, right? Like, and all of us are. All of us are in some sort of quarantine still, even if we have gone out and we protested, we still came home and had to like go through the whole cleansing process and, and all of that. But we are in need of like interaction right now. And sometimes we have to understand what is behind that. Is that interaction because we want reciprocity around our shared values? Or is that interaction because we want to educate somebody? Or is that interaction just because we're ready to fight, right? Like we have this pattern <laughs> of to fight. Right. 
So let's stay on the, the topic of social media. We're on it right now. Uh, thanks to those that are watching. Again, I want to encourage you all, if you have any questions or comments, please send them in. Um, this is a great time, um, and we have a great resource right now that we're talking to. Uh, so please take advantage of that. Um, one of the things that you mentioned um, also on social media was no more than three hours a day. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Let me give you like a little bit of science behind this. Um, this well, part part of the reason why we don't need to be on social media more than three time, three hours a day is because we're absorbing so much information. Every time you scroll through um, a post, your mind registers it. Even if you don't look at all the pictures and details, or you don't read the articles and details your mind starts storing that. And so it gets overwhelmed with a lot of information, right? It's part of the reason we get really tired after we've looked at social media as well. Um, but three hours a day, just so that we can protect our space, we can protect our energy, we can protect our brains and what we're absorbing, and also so that we practice replacement behaviors. You know, it's very tempting when we're at home um, to be on our computers and then to scroll into social media, but what about some of our replacement behaviors? Like having the book next to you and when you want to pick up the phone to scroll through social media, instead you read a couple pages of your book. Or if you're an artist and you like to draw, you have um, some art paper near you and you have your stencils near you. Or if you are a person who likes to create clothes, you have your sewing materials near you. If you're a person who likes to cook, you experiment with some more foods. What happens if we took that time um, that we were on social media and reduce it to only three hours a day, how much more joy would we bring into our life? Because social media isn't always bringing us joy, but we need joy right now because we're hurting. We need healing. We need open spaces to just feel good. And we have to be intentional. We have to put these limits. I have this, um, this setting on my phone that tells me how many hours I'm on my phone a week. And it'll tell me like, Linnell, you have been up wow. or you have been down last week and i get so excited when i'm down i'm like i'm getting down right but then um when i have up week where i'm using my phone a lot more i have to question what's going on with me emotionally that week that i turned to my phone so much and how can i again find a replacement behavior that's more healthy for my mind um more healthy for my soul more healthy for my healing and more healthy for for my family right that which is an important an important element too yeah, I, I didn't even know there were apps to do that. That is, what a great idea. What's the app that you use? I don't need, I'm going to have to, I'll text it to you and you can put it on there. I feel like okay. it would be a setting. The other interesting thing about our phone is, um, is that it comes with a lot, our, not just our phone, but our laptops too. They come with a lot of blue light. And uh, and that actually is not good for our, our eyes, right? The way it registers into our optical cores, it's not healthy for our brains, it's not healthy for the limbic system that's in the back of our brain. And so if we could reduce the amount of blue light exposure that we have. The other interesting thing that I found out recently too is that the blue light from our computers actually um, is actual light the same way that it hits our face. And so um we would need like sunscreen still and we would need to protect our eyes and things like that because it's still light that's projecting wow. coming back on us and it causes us to get tired imagine just sitting in the sun sitting outside and just laying there like at some point you get tired because the sun will drain you the light will drain you and we're experiencing that from our phones and from our um laptops and computers and things as well and then let me do one more thing real quick yeah. <laughs> I told you I have a lot to say. <laughs> That's when why we're here. When it comes to videos, folks, we have got to reduce our video time. I know I said once a week, hang out with your folks, have a good time. But if at all possible, let's try to reduce some of the FaceTiming and some of the Zoom, primarily because our bodies get confused about it. People that are in my generation, X and, and some of the older millennials and then folks that are a little older than me, our brains are not developed for the amount of videos that we're actually doing. I know you, we're like, what, don't call me old, right? I'm not calling you old. <laughs> what I'm saying is we have been developed to respond to interactions by what we see. We can see the person, we can hear the person, but we're also used to feeling the person. We're used to getting a 
an energy feel from them. So not feeling like emotions, but actually feeling their energy, actually feeling their aura, actually feeling their chemicals, actually feeling their thermos, actually sensing and feeling all of that. And so our brains get confused because we're on video and our brains are, are thinking, so I could see the person and I could hear the person, but I can't feel the person. And so then our brains are starting to work even more because we're trying to figure out why can't I feel this person? We get super tired. What's happening with our brains right now is crazy, guys. Our limbic system is overly activated. Our amygdala, which is where we get a lot of our feelings, is overly activated. Our frontal lobe isn't working at the same capacity, even though our jobs are expecting us to be as productive. And we're also in fear based off of the pandemic, based off of what's happening socially, politically, based off of the deaths in our community. And then, so subsequently, our brains are working so hard. There's so much blood flowing through our brains as we're trying to figure this out that our physical bodies don't have the same amount of blood flowing through it and we get sluggish. That's why we're getting tired right now during this pandemic. We're like, we're sitting at home. We're just chilling. Why am I so tired? Well, it's because most of that blood is going through your brain as you're challenging it. And if you could take some of the pressure off by reducing some of the video time, um, then, then it, it helps you a whole lot more. So when you're on Zoom calls, if you're, if you're the boss, encourage your folks to turn their videos off. If you're not the boss, you know, it ask if you can turn your video off, just do audio and do some movement while you're listening too, right? Like you don't have to sit down and take notes. You can walk around your house a little bit. You can sit by your window for a second. You can do some stretches, something to keep your body moving so that your brain isn't having to do as much work and cause you to be so tired. I told y'all talk a lot, Ebony. I'm sorry. No, no, this is this is what we're here for. I'm not the I'm not the expert. Um, I'm just gonna shout out a few people. Amani said, "Ooh, three hours. I need to try that." Amani, you and me both. Um, I'm gonna try to work on that starting today. I'll let you guys know how that works. Um, I apologize if I'm about to mess this name up. Uh, Jossery uh, says it feels exhausting, uh -huh. uh, like everything you were talking about with video and social media yeah. and, and all of that. So I totally uh, get all of that. Is that um, Joe Three? Was that Joe Three Molino? Yes. Uh-huh, Joe Three. Hi, Joe Three. That's one of my friends. <laughs> okay, per and I and I got the name right. <laughs> yes, you did. I'll yes, take you did. it. I'll take it. So <laughs> something um, really fun that uh, you mentioned in the piece was going back to um, – childhood pastimes like yeah. coloring books so i have to say i after reading it or i guess interviewing you um i put on my list like my grocery list coloring book because i'm like it's actually a really good idea like hold on i have to show you this i'm at my desk i doodle like when i'm on the phone mm -hmm. um and i and i feel like it's really therapeutic yeah. um so like look at this see this Yes. Oh, that's perfect. Oh, that's nice. So I do weird stuff like that, but it's like therapeutic, but I can still listen yeah. to the audio of the Zoom, like you said, or, or, yeah. or things like that. So talk about these um, childhood pastimes. I, I love this tip. Yeah. Um, going to your doodling and the coloring book, part of the reason it's therapeutic is because there's a release when you do your eye-hand coordination. As you're doing eye-hand movements, it naturally levels out your breathing. So you, you people can never really be um, breathing heavily as they're using their hands and they're looking at something. And so that's why it feels therapeutic for you because it calms your body, it calms your heartbeat, and it allows more flow through your body. But part of the reason I was talking about pastime, um, it, it reintroducing yourself to pastime experiences is because they are relaxing. Think about when you were a child and something happened, you automatically went outside and played, right? Or you played in your house. And playing allowed you to kind of um, either process what you experienced or it allowed you to have a getaway. Not an avoidance of what was going on, but just a time to kind of get away, right? And, and so that may be that you were coloring. That could have been that you were playing jack. That could have been that you were doing hopscotch. That could have been that you were um, doing all sorts of things, sitting, watching cartoons. You know, my wife um, loves watching cartoons. So there's times when I just 
watcher and she's watching cartoons and I'm coloring in my Minnie Mouse coloring book, right, with my crayons. But there, there's um, something therapeutic in that element. And it's also an element of nostalgia. And we need these positive moments of nostalgia right now. We need memories of when things were a little easier for us. And, and not easier because things weren't happening around the world, but just because we had moments of escape and we didn't necessarily know, right? And so being able to have these nostalgic moments again to remember when life felt good, when life felt light, when life felt safe. And then again, if you're using your eyes and your hands, which is what most childhood experiences require, both eye and hands, then it actually um, puts your breathing in a rhythm too. For Onyx, we did a paint and sip with um, RDC Art Gallery. Um, mm -hmm. The owners of that are um, Rebecca Crouch Pelham and Rachel Crouch. They are um, twin sisters and they are also part of the LGBTQ community. So definitely give them a look at their work, but they do these wonderful paint and sips that really allow people to calm down and to relax and then to create something beautiful that you can look at. And every time you look at it, again, it, it's a reminder of that peaceful time that you had when you were creating. So connecting back with our child time, um, child pasthood memories, for some of us, it was making popcorn on the stove, right? Because we didn't always do the microwave thing. But whatever <laughs> made you feel good, it was beading and making cute little beads and necklaces or bracelets or you know, playing with dolls. It's, we're not above playing with dolls. I am very much happy when people play with dolls. In fact, in therapy, we bring in um, sand trays and figurines and we ask people to play with, play with dolls. And adults are like, I'm not playing with these dolls. Next thing you know, Ebony, they don't want to leave the office, right? They just want to play with their dolls. But we, we tend to think that because we become adults, those things are beneath us. But those things are actually points of joy and points of memories and and points of happiness. So why not bring that back into our life? Why try to find joy by going to um, a spa, which are probably closed right now, and are going somewhere or spending some money? Why do that when we can color in a Minnie Mouse coloring book? Yeah, and joy, joy is important. Um, I was, I've been reading some pieces about how um, Black joy is basically a form of uh, activism and or resistance. It is um, if you really think about it. Like I, I know, um, for me, um, in some weird way, uh, it's like I, I felt guilty about having joy at some point. Um, you know, taking a step back, obviously, as a as a magazine, and I'm like, this is a really fun article, but I, you know should we post this? You, yeah. you get what I'm saying. Yeah. So, um, how do you, how do you balance that? Yeah. Um, it's so funny that you mentioned that because right before I, I um, came on with you, I just finished one of my books that I've been reading and I, I um, emailed all of my, or text all of my friends, these little friend groups I'm telling you about. And I told everybody, guys, guess what? I finished a book today. I did something so unprecedented. I did not work. I just read all day. And they were like, go girl, you know, we're so excited for you because those are points of joy. But I think um, you have to know your own work style. You have to know your own work uh, ethic. You have to know your peak times. Peak times are really important to know when you are the most productive of the day and when you're not the most productive of the day. I love talking to my folks about peak time because it, at your highest peak, that's where you're the most productive and that's probably where you can get a lot of your work done. And when you have these lows in your peak times, if you're in a low moment, that's probably a time where you can do something very relaxing, like reading a book or doodling or coloring or playing with something. The first, so the first thing is to know when you're the most productive. And then be okay that you're not gonna be productive all the time. Like I said a second ago, our limbic system in our back of our brains are completely activated right now, which makes it hard for our frontal lobe to be operating at its highest level of work. So now is not the time to try to um, be innovative with ideas. Now is the time for maintenance, right? And for relaxation. It is something powerful in terms of why the earth, why we have to stop everything right now. Like, has the universe not told us to sit down, right? Like, it is time to sit down. So I think if we're going to talk about activism and advocacy, I think right now we need to sit down because right after this quarantine, we need to go full throttle ahead, right? Like, there is reform that we have to make. 
There are changes that we have to make. We have to heal ourselves in, in, in terms of mental health and things like that. And now is the time where we get to just relax. But most people are not trying to relax, right? Like they're trying to push through because of the country that we live in, where we always have to be productive. Every single moment has to be a productive moment. Um, and as a Virgo, I understand that. <laughs> but I also know that that is not healthy for us. That is how burnout happens. That is how we get numb. That's how we stop liking our job. We stop liking our people. We stop liking our friends. It's because we get burned out and we think we have to move all the time and we don't. So to answer that question, I think the first thing is to connect with self, to understand your peak time, um, and then to have, again, replacement behaviors that are close nearby you. These fun activities don't need to be so far away that you have to walk all the way around your house to go and get something, right? Like keep some of this fun stuff next to you. You're about to do a video, have a coloring book next to you. You're about to, you know, cook some, cook a, a nice meal. Just have something fun, childlike next to you. Play cartoons in the back, but have those things easily accessible so you don't have to work so hard to find joy. We shouldn't have to work so hard to find joy, especially right now. Mm. I love that. Um, I'm just reading some of <laughs> Jacqueline says, amen. Uh, Monty says, burnout is real. Um, and Stephanie says, sometimes I set up a mini fort in my room and color inside of it. Very yes. therapeutic. That is amazing, Stephanie. Oh my gosh, Stephanie. Remember the little port the little forts we used to make with like our couch pillows and stuff yes. like that? We get like little pillows and a sheet over you and, and things like that. One of my friends said that they have a a cardboard um a blow like a cardboard tent that people could kind of get into, right? Like, yes, we absolutely should. Um, be doing those things to feel to feel good, you know. And, and it made me think about for a quick second when we when we come out of surgery or when we're in extreme pain um, for something, our medication is always next to us. Our medication isn't in another room. Our medication isn't in a tucked away in a in a file cabinet. Our medication is next to us. When we're in pain, we need some sort of relief. We're in pain right now, people. We are in pain. We are watching our people die. We are watching black people die across this country. We are watching allies getting hurt in the process of trying to help us. We are watching our, our LGBTQ members, our trans women and men hurting. Like we, and we watch it. Like we, we have seen a live lynching in recent in yeah. recent We have seen in real it. time. Keep, keep your coloring book near you. Keep something that is going to bring you some joy near you because you are in pain and it's okay. You know, as black people and as people in the LGBTQ community, we have tried to hide for so long and like we've been socialized to, to dim our light. Yes. And we yes. our, when we bring attention to ourselves, we bring harm to ourselves. So we're so used to like hiding and cowering in in certain ways. Um, that we don't even acknowledge the pain. Like we, we, we're still afraid to even say like, this is pain. And when we say it, sometimes it comes across as anger and that's perfectly fine. But then the anger is a secondary emotion. There's always an emotion underneath anger, whether it's fear or disappointment or confusion. Sometimes we need to acknowledge those primary emotions too, right? Like I, I am effing confused with what, why this is still happening and, and being able to say that and know the, the, the reactions that come from that and know that that causes pain and you need to heal. And going on the social media all the time isn't helping the healing process. That's like stretching out that pain again and you don't need to do that, right? Like get your information, have your entertainment that you get from there, but limit that to three hours and replace it with things that bring you joy. Write stories, write journals, paint, color, play, watch cartoons, watch old time love movies. I don't care. Just <laughs> play with your makeup. I don't care. <laughs> so, <laughs> what I'm what I'm hearing, and by the way, this laughter is it's I mean, I don't even know the last time I've laughed like this, honestly. Yeah. Um yeah. so I appreciate I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so what I'm hearing is uh it's okay to have joy. We need that as a balance and it's joy. okay angry it's okay to vent uh it's okay to advocate all of it is okay it's okay it's okay it's okay 
it's okay to have all of that. You know, some people tell me, I don't want to have emotions. I don't like having emotions, but emotions are so much part of who we are. We don't, we, just as we are thoughts, we are emotions, right? Now, the thing is, you have to be careful on how you act on your emotions. Every emotion isn't a catalyst for a behavior. Every emotion shouldn't be acted upon, right? Because that would be impulsive and not responsible. But we have all these emotions. Acknowledge the emotions. As a therapist, my belief is once you at least say the emotion out loud, that takes a weight off of you. So many people come to me, Ebony, and they tell me things that they have not said to anyone. And then the moment they say it, you can see their body just relax. They just, oof, I'm, I got it off of me, right? Um, and so it's okay to have those emotions. Have them. Live them. Experience them. I tell my clients all the time, don't pretend like you don't have that emotion. Sit with the emotion. Write the emotion in a word. Write the emotion on something. I, I also tell my clients to text me. Sometimes they be texting me. They be having emotions in the middle of the night. I'm like, <laughs> but, um, say it. Get it out. Get it out. Because once you get it out, then you can kind of move forward. But yes, it is okay. We should have emotions. Um, it, I, there's a quote. I can't think of the person right now. Is it? Is it James Baldwin that says to be black um, and conscious in this country is to constantly be enraged? Like, mm. that's the emotion. Exactly. Yeah. It's here. And it's even scarier for us as queer people, right? Because we can't just be, right? We have to, we can't just be who we are. We got to be black, queer people. We got to have an additional label to the identity that brings more attention. That's not always safe, but but that also doesn't allow us to just be heard because now people have to hear that, oh, this is a queer person talking, right? And they don't give us the respect that they always should because they, they think uh, through their filters about who we are. But that's our work to continue to advocate through. That's our work to kind of push through. That's our work to continue to show people that we are more than their stereotypes. We are more than their biases. We are more than their filters. Um, and all of our thoughts are based off of who we truly are and not just these little pieces of identity that were asked to separate into boxes. Yeah. yeah. I love uh, what you're talking about, like just saying how you feel. It, that sounds so simple, but a lot of us don't do it. You know, if you think mm -hmm. about, you know, even friends and family checking in on you, how are you doing? It's so easy to just say, I'm good. I'm fine. Yeah. I mean, that's just, it's just easy to do. Yeah. Um, which leads me to my next question. You're saying that a lot of your clients um, are just spilling it to yeah. you. Um, yeah. Let's talk about how important um, therapy is. Um, yeah, uh, I'm sure you can explain <laughs> this tremendously. You're asking, me, you're asking me to wrap up like 16 years of lived experience in like two seconds. Okay, right? okay. So let's, do, let's do this. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> well, in your opinion, you know, obviously it's it's up to anybody that they, you know, if they want to see a therapist or not, specifically yeah. because we're gearing this conversation towards black and queer people. Absolutely. Tell tell us um, how beneficial it is uh, yeah. for us uh, and what we should be doing as we're seeking the right therapist. I think that question, again, could be answered on so many different levels, right? Yeah. One of the things uh, you and I were talking about that was important is that as let's talk about it in 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 pockets, right? Okay. As black people, we were consistently socialized to keep our family business in the house. Yep. Do yep. not air your dirty laundry. We don't care what is happening in this house. If there's domestic violence, if we are not eating, if you know if there is abuse, whatever the case may be, we're told you keep that in the house, meaning you can't even tell your cousin, right? So we were socialized to keep secrets. And then as people in the LGBTQ community, for some of us, especially folks in my generation or some of the older millennials, and then of course the folks that are much older than us, we couldn't even talk about the feelings we had. The moment, the moment I saw a little girl and I was like, ooh, that's a thing right there. You know what I mean? Like, that's a thing. We could, who am I sharing that with? Not my little third girl, my third grade friend. I'll be like, girl, what's wrong with you? You know, because we couldn't talk about it. So we went all these years 
socialize from our our racial community and then and then the silence to some degree and not some degree silence in our gender our excuse me our sexual orientation community that by the time we became adults we didn't know what to say and who to say it to and who could we trust because the implication of saying it to the wrong person could lead to death right like you could die from telling somebody that you're a lesbian or that you're queer or that you're gay right like if you could get more consequences for you and your family if you said that you guys weren't eating at home, right? Because you could end up in some sort of system. So then we had years, decades worth of just holding secrets and being reinforced by family to tell secrets. And then we say, then somebody says, Linnell, you need therapy. What? You want me to sit in front of this complete stranger and tell them 20 to 30, or in my case, almost 40 years of, of secrets? 40 years of thought, 40 years of feelings. What are you saying to me, right? Like, so the moment a client calls us at Onyx and says, I want therapy, I am trying to make all the arrangements happen, right? Because the, just the courage to say, I am ready to start talking about this is a really big deal. So what I find though, is that most people don't interview us. Most clients don't interview their counselors. And, yeah. and I think it's because they think all counselors are good. Now, let me tell you, shout out to Onyx. We are all amazing, right? <laughs> of course, of course. And I have a good network of counselors um, outside of Onyx that I actually, that I make lots of referrals to because they are amazing. But I'll be honest with you, Ebony, every therapist is not good. Every therapist is not good. And when you have cultural implications on silence and then you have uh, in terms of race and then you have another cultural implication on silence in terms of your sexual orientation and then for some of us if you have another cultural uh implication of silence based off of your gender the person you finally decide to speak to needs to be ready for all of that and how do you know if they're ready you interview them ask them the questions ask them the hard questions any good therapist is going to be excited that you're asking questions because it's going to show us that you are very much interested in our work and how we're going to help you right you wouldn't just go into surgery without asking your surgeon how many times they've done this work so why go to your therapist and not ask them how many how many folks on your caseload are part of the lgbt what are your thoughts around racial discrimination what are your thoughts around this we as counselors are told to um, to have a certain level of objectivity, but that that's because are not just objectivity. We're told to have certain um, barriers up so that our clients don't fully know who we are. But that only works because the history of psychology in this country is based off of white men in Europe, right? Therapy was developing all over the world, but before but because of language barriers and publication barriers and politics. Therapy that started in the continent of Africa is not popularized today. But Freud is from right, right, right. Europe, right? And so these those founders of psychology have these ideas that we're not supposed to engage with your therapist. But culturally, as black people, as people in the community, we want to understand that a person relates to us. They don't have to have the same experiences as us, but they understand that. So, so I don't have to be in a therapy session teaching my therapist what it means to be bisexual and how bisexual is different than lesbian, even though I'm married to a woman, right? right, right. Like I shouldn't have to teach my therapist that. I should know whether they know certain things by interviewing them. So what kind of questions do you need to be asking your therapist? Where did they go to school? All schools are not good schools, right? They need to probably go to schools that are gonna have a high level of interaction where they got a lot of time to practice therapy before they actually graduate beyond practicum and internship, they needed to go in lab courses. They need to know who are their sort of therapy mentors, who are the people that they're watching in the field. They need to, you, we need to be able to ask, what are your thoughts and opinions around racial discrimination, mm -hmm. around gender expression, around gender identity, around sexual orientation? We need to ask those questions. They are not just giving us the intake, like, I'm talking as a client, your counselor is going to ask you a lot of questions that first session and you need to be asking them questions <laughs> because if you don't, you find yourself sitting in a session six months down the line and realizing that you have not grown. 
And everybody is like, well, Linnell, didn't you go to therapy? Yes. Oh, great. You and these therapists, ask them questions. If you are trusting them with your life, your mental health, your mental health. Yeah. You need to have, you need to ask questions. You can't just go blindly into these conversations with folks. Right. And your mental health is priceless. There's no price on that. That's it's priceless. Sure. And, I, and nothing else can fully work. Your, your physical body can't even fully work if your mental health isn't strong. So we have to be serious about this. And, and I hate to say it, but some of my colleagues in the field are not prepared to work with us in the LGBTQ community, which is why I'm introducing that course to Hopkins, because I need more counselors to know how to work with us. Work with us. Yeah, it's, it's true. I've experienced that. So everything you're saying, I've sat in a room with a therapist that like just didn't get me and I felt like was judging me. And they may have not, but I just felt like they didn't they didn't have the experience, you know. Um, and, and I also like what you said, and I'm going to get to some of these comments and questions, by the way. Um, I like what you said. Um, Obviously, it's nice to sit across from someone who does, you know, look like you and has that experience. But um, you don't have to. Um, mm -hmm. uh, one of the best uh, therapists I've, I've had um, was actually a trans man, mm -hmm. um, a white trans man. And, and I felt so comfortable because he had that experience with all of our community. Yes. Um, and I was able to ask those questions. Um, yes. so I, I think that's also a great point as well. Um, let me say, um, Appreciate that breakdown of silence because our silence will not protect us. No, it doesn't. Our silence does not protect us. In fact, sometimes our silence is more of a weapon that we use against ourselves, right? Like we can't heal what we don't acknowledge, right? We can't, you think about your physical body. Um, if, if you have this pain in your abdomen and you never go to the doctor, then you can't heal it. You're just sitting there with it and it's growing and it's causing more issues and more infection. The same thing for our mental health. Like if you don't say it, if you don't acknowledge it, if you don't address it, then then it causes more issues. And the truth is that sometimes, Ebony, we're scared to acknowledge some of that stuff. Sometimes we're scared to say that somebody hurt me that much because then we think, oh, I'm giving them power or, oh, it's going to stop me or, oh, I'm going to have this breakdown. But that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Like, I've worked with hundreds of clients in my 16 years of experience, and very few of them have had a breakdown to that to a degree where I had to get them hospitalized. And when they did need to get hospitalized, I was right there with them. Mm -hmm. I'm right there with you, right? And you are not going to experience this alone. But for the most part, we are afraid of the breakdown. But it's not likely to happen. It's not likely to happen. And I know people are like, Linnell, you know, are you sure about that? It, it can't, I have 16 years of experience here, folks. And I experience therapy for myself. I go to my therapist every Friday at 10 o'clock. I love her. And people say, why do you go to therapy and you're a therapist? Because I need, I want to talk too. Yeah. I want to talk about too, right? Like, and I want to be a role model for therapy. I don't want to just say, I'm a therapist, so go to therapy. No, I know the vulnerability that it feels to sit across from a counselor and then share your darkest thoughts, right? Or share, you know, some of your most confusing thoughts. I know the feeling. And so that makes me a better therapist because I know how to be a client too. Yeah. Uh, Michelle, thank you for that comment. Um, we have a really great question um, from Melanie. Melanie asks, is there a difference between a therapist and a life coach? Great question. Yeah, there is. Therapists are trained in, um, in more psychological processes. Um, and so we are trained in different theories that are specifically connected to um, our psyche. So our brain in terms of the neurological functioning, as well as our mind, which is a connection to our cognitive, our cognitive functioning. And we also have different approaches, whether we're addressing it from feelings, we're addressing it from thoughts, whether we're addressing it from behaviors. And a lot of it has to do with um, emotions and the expression of emotions and how we kind of navigate life. Life coaches are coaches. Think about um, when you play a sport and your coach is seeing where some behaviors are off and they need to coach you so that you could achieve your goals. So think about a life coach as a person who coaches what's happening in your life 
behaviorally. So they're looking at your behaviors. Some life coaches will talk about the, the psychological um, processes and implications, but most won't. Most life coaches are focused on what are your behaviors and how do we help you meet your goals? What kind of changes do we need to make in your behaviors to help you make your goals? Counselors are thinking about um, your psyche and your emotions and um, your childhood development and, and your identity and all of those things that are uh, much more uh, encompassing of who you are. Right. And you said counselor. Um, uh, it's funny. Uh, Amani is saying, so what's the difference between a therapist and a counselor? Uh -huh. And then Melanie has followed up and said, um, do you recommend having both? I guess she's uh, asking life coach and, and therapist. Um, so it's a lot going on here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Therapists, I, I often use the term counselor and therapist um, interchangeably because I identify as both. But um, counselors are are focused very much on a wellness model. So they focus on how we prevent things from happening, um, how we empower our clients and how we use their experiences to create a better help them create a better life. Therapists often spend a lot of time doing more psych. the you may find therapists do, working with more of the major disorders, right? So um, not that counselors don't, because we absolutely work with depression and anxiety and things like that. But therapists also work with personality disorders um, and and things like that. So there's there's a very slight distinction between therapist and counselor. Most mental health professionals, whether they're social workers or counselors or psychologists, can also call themselves therapists based on the population that they're working with. The difference in our mental health field has to do with social workers who are who often look at more um, macro level issues and how they they impact the individual person. Counselors uh, again approach it from a wellness model. Psychologists do a lot of work around the psyche, but also a lot of work around assessments and diagnoses and things like that too. A lot of our work is starting to overlap nowadays, um, but internally internally in the mental health field, we have like our own little banter batter. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And um, uh, Melanie uh, is asking, do you recommend both as far as life coach and a therapist? Yeah, I don't. Right now, I don't believe that life coaches uh, can get paid by insurance. So one of the factors that one may need to consider is what are your financial resources? Can you afford to be in both therapy and a life coach? Um, what are your your barriers that you're experiencing right now? Do you feel like they're more emotionally based or more behaviorally based? If they're behaviorally based, and I would say, you know, you could go to a counselor, but I also love life coaches. And so you can go to a life coach, too. You could reach us at Onyx because we could connect you with some great life coaches that are part of the LGBTQ community also. Um, but I, I am always a supporter of therapy, always. So if you can do therapy and add in life coaching, I think that's beautiful. I will always recommend therapy first because there's so many things that we store that we don't even realize that are that are impacting who we are and how we work in the world. And therapy helps to break that down a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you for that. I hope that uh, answered. I hope that answered it, Melanie. Sorry. Yeah, no, she definitely. And um, people are saying that, that it was very helpful. So that's great. Um, what I like what you said, and I want to make sure people heard that. Um, not a lot of life coaches take insurance and we have to remember we don't you know everybody we don't know everybody's financial situation there are people that can come out of pocket for therapists life coach a hundred dollars plus a session um, but there are some that can and so it's really good to look and see who's in your network if yeah. you don't have the funds to just come out of pocket yeah yeah and your insurance is a I mean that would be a whole other conversation Ebony when when we're picking our insurance, sometimes for our companies, we just randomly pick certain things and we're not paying attention to the implications for that. Um, some people pick like low premiums and high deductibles and then they want to go into counseling and they have to pay out of pocket for a lot of sessions before their insurance company hits. And so that would probably be something else that we could talk about later in terms of like um, managed health care and things this like that. Like series with us. We can do it. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm loving it. it. Um, okay, so there's a question from Tiara. Hey, Tiara, how's it going? Uh, she asks, sometimes it's necessary to fire your therapist slash counselor. 
What are some tips you can give to help navigate that process without traumatizing yourself? Great yeah. question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sometimes it's just not a good fit, right? Um, and and you have to know what you want to get out of counseling. If you want to have an experience where you get to just talk, then you need to be with a counselor who can just listen, right? Some counselors talk too much. Some uh, you need to know if if you need to talk about certain issues, and the counselor is trained on that and not trained on that. I think when it comes to, I, I think what helps us prevent traumatizing ourselves is having a clear idea of what we want from counseling. And if we're not getting that, we walk away. It's similar to if you go to a restaurant and they're not serving what you want to eat, you tell them, thank you for giving me this opportunity, but I'm going to go to another restaurant. And it's very matter of fact, right? Like you just do it, but you have to know what you want before you can make that decision. And sometimes we don't always know what we want. Um, so if you're going to have the conversation with your therapist, like you've already made the decision that this isn't a good fit, then you will tell them just that, you know, like th there's some things that I wanted to experience here in therapy and I'm not getting that yet. It's really important to me to prioritize my mental health. So although I appreciate you as a person, I recognize that this fit is not the, me the best one for me. So is it possible for you to make a recommendation or a referral? Um, and that's if you want them to make a referral. Uh, otherwise, you can find another counselor, you know, on your own. But we are ethically required to give clients referrals if they ask for referrals. Prior to that, though, Tiara, when you're when you're in your sessions and you're recognizing you're not getting what you want, I would encourage you and all folks who are having that experience to stop in that session and say exactly what you need. Right. Like I need this. Because counselors are human too, and they all have their own theoretical orientations. They all have their own styles. They all have their own therapeutic modalities. And they may not always know what you need, right? Like we carry perceptions as we go into therapy, and sometimes therapists carry perceptions as they go into therapy. And they're not supposed to, but sometimes they do. And that's where the mishap happens. But if you could, if you would be willing, then I encourage you to tell your therapist in that moment what you need and then give them a session or two to figure out if they can get it for, if they can do it for you, if they themselves can provide that need. And if they cannot, then throw the deuces and find somebody else. <laughs> because your mental health is too important to try to be loyal to some professional, right? Like you don't need to be loyal to us. You got to be loyal to yourself. Yeah, no, that's that's great, great advice. Uh, long story short, throw the deuces, Tiara. Oh, peace. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna take one more question, uh, and then we can wrap it up. And I think this is actually maybe a really great question to end on. Earlier, you talked about ways to take a break and check in with yourself and talk care of and take care of yourself. But how do you go about once we fully return to the work schedule? How can we incorporate self-care while working? Yeah, I think that becomes a measure of, of me uh, management. Um, and I, that's actually, thank you for the question, Imani. That's actually something that I've been thinking about a lot myself because I've been enjoying um, having lazy mornings, going for walks with my dog um, and things like that. And I, I found myself, to be transparent, I found myself getting a little anxious when I was like, oh my goodness, I'm gonna have to be back in the office at nine o'clock in the morning. How am I going to make this happen? So first thing was in that moment, I had to say, Linnell, that's not your reality right now. Your reality right now is that you are sitting in this moment and you get to have this peace. You get to have this joy. You get to have this self-care. Then, then when I was calm, I started creating a plan. So what adjustments do I need to make in my time to be able to still get self-care? One of the issues that we have in our country uh, especially as black people, is that we don't set firm boundaries for ourselves. We think that if we set boundaries that we're selfish, um, and that's that's part of what we were told, right? Like, especially based off of your religion, we were told, like, be selfless, right? Like, give, 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 because God gave, right? Um, and so we don't necessarily put boundaries on our time. So we'll be at work and we'll say, I'll just finish one more task. Or, you know, we'll be having a phone conversation with somebody and we're tired and we need to get off and we'll say, I'm just going to give them five more minutes. Oh, the yes. more you say, I'm just, then you need to check yourself. I'm just, 
should be a trigger thought for you that you are doing too much, that yeah. you are pushing your own boundaries. And people will not respect your boundaries if you don't respect your own boundaries. So your trigger language for yourself should be, I just, if you're about to say, I just, to cut it off right then. Um, but make sure that you that you have some sort of plan for your self-care. Again, your self-care doesn't have to be always going outside. It could be coloring in a coloring book. It could be doodling somewhere. You know, your self-care can happen in many places, uh, including at work. You know, you could have a self-care break. I, I um, know Imani personally, so I know that she's a teacher. And so she might have to carve in some additional what that looks like and have conversations with your supervisors, have conversations with your bosses around um, how how there needs to be a shift in culture of work environment to allow for self-care because we're all going to be healing when we return back to work. Yeah, that's that's great. And that's a great note to end on. I, I love uh, the whole I just yeah, I'm just going to that's. Yeah. That's a great tip um, and it's in the realm of being able to just say no as yeah. well. You know what I mean? That we, haven't been taught that we haven't been taught that though, Ebony, right? Like just yeah. like we haven't always been taught financial literacy, right? Which is right. why sometimes we're making the same mistakes that our parents make. We haven't always been taught to say no. Um, even, and it starts in childhood. I know we're about to go, but it starts in childhood for all those parents that are listening right now. Don't make your children hug people that they don't want to hug. That's, the, um, that's, that's when you first tell them that their intuition is not right. And you tell them that their boundaries, that they should not have boundaries around people. That's the that's one of the first lessons. Go over there and hug such and such. If they don't want to, it's not rude. It's that they get to create their own boundaries for themselves. And sadly, uh, as black people where respect was so important for us, um, the respect sometimes came at the at the expense of our own boundaries and so we don't always know how to say no and we don't always know how to how to you know follow our intuition although we are very spiritual people we are the first people of this of this world um and and give given the gift of intuition but sometimes we don't always follow it because we've been socialized um to not have boundaries and so that's why it's harder for us to create boundaries and it makes it even more difficult if you sit at the intersection at the identity of a woman um, because that women were also socialized to not have um, boundaries, right? Yeah. Even so that when we get violated, we get blamed, right? It's because we didn't do such and such, but, but that's, not, that's not fair and it's not the case. And we really have to shift how we talk to people and, and promote having boundaries and promote when people say no and, and recognize that we have to say no to take care of ourselves. Saying no is an act of revolution. Saying no is a matter of self care. I was gonna ask you what's what's a great note to end on and that's that's it. Saying no is yep. uh, seriously um that's a that's a great point. I'm sure some parents that are watching <clears throat> really appreciated that. I, I never thought of that. I just thought the whole hugging thing is creepy in general, but it, it also makes sense as far as the boundaries and things go. But I, I just want to say thank you really quickly. How can people find you? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Well, with this, with this long name on the screen, all you have to do is Google it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to my in-laws and the Marcano family, right? I had a hyphenated. Um, but I can be found at on our website at uh, group onyxtherapygroup.com. We are also on Instagram, and we love followers because we love putting out all these cool messages. Um, but we are onyx underscore therapy underscore group. Uh, on Instagram and that connects to our Facebook also. The best way to get in contact with us is through our email. We have a policy of responding within 24 to 38 hours. It's really difficult when I give out phone numbers because sometimes people call and they wanna talk to somebody, but we're therapists. So we're usually in sessions and not always available to pick up a phone, but we respond to emails um, quite often. But hit us up on our website. We put a lot of great information up there. Follow us on Instagram. And we have um, amazing counselors. We have, I think, 14, 15 counselors right now working with us. And, and they are doing amazing work 
um, with the company and on their own too. So come and see us. Many of us are part of the LGBTQ community. We have the same ideas yes. as well. Um, and, and we're here to work with our folks. We're here to serve. Awesome. Thank you so much. Just a couple of things. I want to uh, thank Lion and Dove Wines again for sponsoring this great conversation. We really appreciate you all. Um, also, we really want to leave um, something tangible for you all. So please, uh, right after this, we're going to post <clears throat> we have a nice uh, image and list of uh, resources for Black queer healing and self-care. Uh, Onyx is one of those. Um, Audrey Lord Project has some great healing toolkits as well as Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Um, they also have some great healing toolkits as well. So please uh, go to our Facebook page, Tag Magazine, uh, and we'll post that for you. We want to make sure um, that you guys are taking care of yourselves. So stay connected with TAG. We're going to have more conversations like this. And Linnell, thank you so much. There continues to take care of yourself. We love you and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Ebony. Thanks, guys.